All right, let's continue with the next part, which is the actual description of the requirements. And there's a very, very nice quote from the software engineering book, which you can see here. It's natural for a system developer to interpret an, interpret an ambiguous requirement in a way that simplifies its implementation. Often, however, this is not what the customer wants. This is very, very true. <laughs> so any developer will probably take the path of least resistance and Conversely, to, to avoid um, disputes later on, the requirements must already be as, as precise and as unambiguous as possible upfront. So we must be very clear about what the system should actually do. And um, there's different ways of doing that. Of course, you can just have uh, just natural la written language and sentences, um, maybe with a couple of additional diagrams. And this is uh, exactly the user and system requirements document, Lasten und Pflichtenheft in German, which we already discussed earlier on. Um, then as a step up, we can have structured language. This is uh, still written language, but with a with a specific template that's uh, used to to give a bit more structure to the um, to the requirements. We can have something like uh, UML and uh, related things, which also helps to take out a bit of um, ambiguity. And last but not least, for specific cases, we can also have mathematical specifications, which are probably the most precise way but also the most difficult way of uh, of writing down uh, requirements so let's have a look at a couple of examples for each of these types of requirement description um, let's say we're talking about, uh, about an insulin pump which is of course a very safety critical um, medical device and um, if we just have a brief description of the requirement and the rationale which leads to that requirement, then this can already be considered a natural language uh, requirements description. In these descriptions, usually there's one formalism that you should be aware of. If uh, a requirement is mandatory, absolutely, then it's described as shall. If it's uh, optional, then it's described as should. So. And here the, the description basically is the system shall measure the blood, blood, blood sugar sorry, and deliver insulin if required every 10 minutes. So, um, and the, the reason for that is that uh, it's not necessary to measure more often than every 10 minutes. If we measure less frequently, then uh, the, the sugar levels could, could rise too far. And um, this is, of course, still quite ambiguous. So um, it doesn't actually say when is it required. So this is something you can't really, if, if, you, if you're not a, a doctor, not an expert in, in diabetes, then this won't help you at all to properly implement this, uh, this insulin pump. Um, for that reason, it will already help a lot to have this so-called structured language uh, requirements description. Here we have a list of attributes and a description for each attributes. And the attributes are the core function of uh, this requirement. So to compute the insulin dose, then a closer description of the function especially the inputs, the source of the inputs, the outputs, and the destination of the outputs. So here the inputs are the current and the two previous readings of the blood sugar level. The source is a, a sensor. Um, the output is the actual um, compute, computed dose. And the destination of that is the control loop. And then here is the um, actual description of how the system works, um, which is a little hard to parse, but in general, all, everything is there. And the requirements are that um, you have two readings, so you can actually, actually compute the rate of change. Um, 
precondition is that we have enough insulin left in the reservoir to, to give a, a suitable dose. And the post condition is that we replace the um, oldest reading with the second oldest and the second oldest with the current one and then continue again with the next iteration basically. So this is already a lot less ambiguous. The biggest problem for this sort of description still is the part with the action because it takes quite a bit of, of reading and taking notes to figure out what the um, what the function is actually supposed to do. So a dose is zero if the sugar level is stable or falling or if the level is increasing but the rate of increase is decreasing. So what exactly does this mean? And for that kind of application you can then switch to a mathematical uh, requirements description and here this is now very clear. This is almost uh, close already to, to pseudocode that you can say if the level is falling, so the current reading is less than the uh, previous one, then we don't deliver insulin at all. Even, same if it's uh, stable. Even if it's increasing, but the rate of increase is decreasing, then we still get, don't give out insulin. Only if the level is increasing and the rate of increase is also uh, stable or rising, then um, we compute uh, how much insulin we are supposed to hand out. And there's a minimum dose, I don't know, three units from the previous description that we will always deliver in that case. So this is really, uh, it's actually something you can almost one-to-one -one already uh, translate into code. And this is the most unambiguous way to, to describe something like this. And if you're dealing with a with a safety critical system like a medical device or also with uh, something uh, related to space flight, for example, or to um, big engineer, big machinery, something like that, um, then it's usually a good idea to have this sort of really unambiguous mathematical description, which you can more or less directly translate into code. All right, so let's say we've written down our requirements. The last step then is to actually validate them. So of course we need to figure out if all the requirements which we came up with in the elicitation and maybe also the feasibility studies are actually met. Then is it consistent? So sometimes there are actually conflicts between the requirements. Of course we need to identify these and either resolve them or at least be aware of them so that we can can prioritize later on. Then is it actually realistic? Can we... Uh, so this is kind of a, a double check uh, going back to the feasibility study. So with the resources we have, with the technology we have, can we implement our requirements? Or do we basically need to, to invent new things that are actually able to meet our requirements? And last but not least, uh, when our project is done, can we actually verify the requirements uh, with respect to the document? Are there things which we can um, basically cross off our list uh, in, the, in the final tests of our product? Um, so how do we do that? We can have reviews, which is basically just reading the document uh, and the the uh, requirements description. Um, it's a good idea to have the external reviewers who, who haven't been involved with the process previously do that because they will just bring a fresh perspective and will not um, uh, be influenced by what they already know about the, the requirements elicitation pro uh, process. Um, we can do prototypes, so maybe a mock-up, maybe even a paper mock-up for a user interface thing, something really simple, which is, however, um, already uh, trying to follow the requirements and which we can then review again with our stakeholders. And um, we can use the requirements to create test cases up front, which we will then later on use to, to actually validate our, our uh, software. Uh, so this is also something we can use to double check the requirements to create um, 
a couple of test cases for later use during development. Um, if we want to create test cases for non-functional requirements, this is something that's sometimes a bit of a of a dilemma sometimes. So, uh, but we can of course map these still to things that can be tested. So, for example, if there are speed requirements, then we can have something like how many transactions the system can handle per second, for example, or what the response time is. Uh, ease of use is really difficult to measure. So, um, something like how much training people usually need to to use the system or maybe even how large the manual is can relate to how easy to use a specific piece of of software is for example then reliability can be mapped to how long it actually can can run at a time how how much time is there between individual uh, individual failures um, and last but not least robustness can for example be related to after failure has occurred, how long does it take to, to be back on, online? How likely is it over the course of a year, for example, that some uh, some da data is becoming corrupted and so on? So these are all things that we can um, verify later on. Uh, of course, uh, this probability of data corruption, for example, is something that's hard to really um, verify properly so maybe you would actually need to run the software for 10 years to be able to to answer that uh, up to a certain level of correctness so some of these can only be estimates of course but they are still values that you can um, can put into your tests for example at least transactions per second or something like that is something you can easily test actually or in an automated way that you can actually integrate into your build environment for example all right, so last but not least, let's have a look at how this relates to the actual software processes. If we have something like a waterfall process, something very uh, traditional and rigid, then uh, the requirements engineering is basically done as the very first step of the um, development process. And even if the requirements engineering has a couple of internal uh, iterations and cycles we finish with a requirements document and that is then used throughout the rest of the of the project is, isn't changed anymore and this is of course also uh, one of the main reasons why these traditional processes are considered to be quite inflexible um, on the other hand in agile processes we have a, a, an interleaved uh, again interleaved process so we have development phases and we have requirements engineering phases which which alternate um, even in an agile process however we will probably do at least a very short feasibility analy analysis as the very first step um, to see if it would actually make sense to to start with with the project at all and um, of course you can also have a, a hybrid approach so when, where you have a re requirements engineering phase uh, alternating with the prototyping phase and then when that is finished when your prototypes are, are sufficiently close to the requirements and everybody agrees on that then you write it down as a requirements document and then keep that for the rest of the project that would also be an option to kind of um, have have a hybrid approach that's neither completely agile nor completely uh, traditional but is kind of interleaving two phases only until you have a result all right so much for requirements engineering thanks for listening everyone and see you next week again